places. So work can be redeemed. This is the way work could be. We're going to look at um, some verses again. And the first verse we're going to look at actually bounces off a comment that we just had, um, which was really helpful about how sovereign God is over all the world. So we're going to look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. Um, you've got that space um, on your handouts. This is a passage, a beautiful passage in scripture about Jesus being sovereign over everything. I want you to read that again, discuss it in your groups, and, uh, and then we'll collect some comments from the tables about what you see here. How would this relate to our work? How does Jesus' supremacy impact on the potential for our work? How could we see our work differently? What is affected in this passage? What does it mean for us to be agents of reconciliation? That passage talks about reconciliation. What about our role in that as well? Okay, just a few moments for you to work in tables.
It's beautiful language in these verses, but it may be um, a little hard to understand. So ha let's see how we go. Um, so we have roving Anne with the mic <laughs> coming around. Where will she start? Yeah, yeah, let's have one from each table again. Just, just one idea that, <laughs> that you got from this. Come on, Dorothy, you can do this. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's good. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 20. How does Jesus' supremacy impact us on the potential for work? The very first thing that says that is Jesus is supreme over all. He is before all things created. He then goes into speak of the rulers and authorities of the earth and remind us that Jesus created them all and they all ultimately answer to him. He is what holds all things together. He is the sustainer of all creation. I used to, as I discussed with my mates here, uh, Mrs. Jacob and Mrs. Young, it's not easy, especially when you are in the workplace and there's the superior who thinks you should be shut up they should be the one talking and not you but over the uh, last two years when we had so many zoom lessons on the bible study i was asked to lead and suddenly and amazingly i learned that the word of god stands and it says here god is the holding supremacy of all when we speak and we know the word of god you are standing on the word of god you stand for jesus you have the wisdom of god you not only have the knowledge but now the knowledge is translated into you to stand up and say what is rightfully correct because you walk the talk people will now look at you know you are honest know you are reliable know you are responsible know you have that ethical principle that sustains you they see you as somebody who really work the action so they will listen to you and that is wisdom from above so you will be able to create an impact that will affect others because you are now doing the groundwork you are now work hands-on. The hands-on is very important because you give credit to the others. And they, when they see you work together, uh, do not shout at them. It creates an atmosphere in which you are providing an atmosphere of reconciliation. So they are able to listen and the work is being done. So therefore, this particular lesson helps us to realize that what we do does affect others. What we say does affect their mood. What we are going to do at the end result, people will see it and credit will be given, not only to you, but to the whole team because you must always work as a team. You reconcile as a team. Thank you. Woo! <laughs> I'm prepared to hand over the workshop at this point, but <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you, that's brilliant, I love it. Remembering that Jesus is supreme and we reconcile, we are part of his process of reconciling in our very workplaces. Thank you so much, beautifully said. Okay, do we have some additional comments? Okay. Thank you, Brother Ho. There's the Christ become the center of our life. We often said Christ-centered life. Actually, we may not really obey Him all the time. So there's a danger. So I'm not afraid now when He said Christ now is the head. He is my Lord. Not only my Lord, He is the Lord of all my bosses, my government authority, my prime minister. So I'm not afraid of them. Just, so let me think of even Daniel and his friend. 
They're not afraid of King Nebuchadnezzar, Darius. If you don't bow down to this statue, you'll be thrown into a lion den. They're not afraid. God will rescue because Jesus is above all of them. Who is the king? King of kings is Jesus, not the earthly one. So that makes us very bold that we will not do our work in violation with God's word. I obey Jesus above all my bosses. <laughs> Provided they don't violate God's word, I will obey them, submit to their authority. Amen. Thank you very much. A beautiful reminder that Jesus is the boss above all bosses. <laughs> we need to be reminded sometimes of that. Hmm. Okay. Who is Arne going to choose next? <laughs> I try to relate what what I understand, what is reconciliation here? <clears throat> reconciliation here means uh, God has accepted us through the sacrifice of Jesus. Before, before Christ died on the cross, we were enemies of, of God because of our sins. So God could not accept us. And uh, God sent Jesus to die on the cross to pay, shed the blood as a atoning sacrifice. And that is acceptable to God. So when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, then God accept us through Jesus Christ. Look, God looked at us through the lens of Jesus Christ. That's what I understand as reconciliation to God. So when we are agents of reconciliation, that means we, we are like uh, agents, like we, we introduce other people, telling them the good news that this is the way to go to God, to be, uh, to be reconciled back to God. Uh, we are the ambassadors of Christ. We, we, we tell other people about this good news that we can be reconciled back to God by accepting Jesus because God will look at us through the lens of Jesus Christ. Uh, that's all I want to share. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. So as agents of reconciliation, we're letting people know what we ourselves have experienced of reconciliation with God through Jesus' blood. Yeah. That's cool. Okay, next table. <laughs> Elizabeth, did you want to say something? Or? <laughs> Actually, just now I shared to both of them already. I wish to take from Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. Thank you very much for brother at the back sharing, enlightening, that are uh, trying to understand the word reconcile also. God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace. So I just like struck, struck me things on earth because I was sharing to Clara and this sister here because uh, I can only speak from my context of office because uh, other part of my life are not very, uh, very... Uh, very experienced. My experiential knowledge is within my place of work. Because many times my colleagues uh, employ employee, either they quarrel, so they will send email and say, oh, you, you, you are not grateful. You, uh, don't forget, I was the one who recruited you. So what do we do if you are a Christian in the office? Do you aggravate the situation and gossip with other staff and add more to it? Or do, are you a peacemaker? So, you know, in the KPI index, key performing index, they don't use the word reconciler or they don't use the word peacemaker. They use the word harmonizer, you know, like you try to minimize conflicts. So I, I really believe that whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace, you know, through the blood of Jesus Christ. So we as Christians, we should try to minimize, reduce conflicts in the office. So I think that's my uh, best understanding of you know, uh, you know, uh, bringing reconciliation in the workplace. Yeah, the world the world uses harmonizer. Yeah, 
sometimes Christian uses the word peacemaker. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Jesus said, didn't he, in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. Who's going to be on this table? Who's going to speak? Awesome. Um, I believe this Colossian talking about Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, we are reconciled to God uh, through his death. But here your question is, what does it mean for us to be agent or considering? Is it related? To, uh, your question is related to work. I mean, is this question related to work? Yes. Okay, meaning if we are the, to be the agent of reconciliation in work, meaning we will share Christ with our colleagues or with our bosses or this thing, right? Does it mean, mean, mean by this? <laughs> well, in I'll be place, going on about that a bit later, but yes, that's part of it, yes. <laughs> so that would be great. <laughs> that would be great. You know, you know I mean? If, you know, we can use our workplace to share gospel, share Christ with our colleagues in our workplace. I mean, to me, that would be very meaningful. Okay, marketplace. This is a marketplace, one, right? This is a witnessing in a marketplace. Yeah. Okay. So the marketplace can be a place where we can be. Yeah. Bring can that message. Witness, Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Two more tables. Two more tables. Well, Colossians chapter 1, the reference given to us is pointing out the fact that Jesus is, Jesus, yeah, Jesus, uh, the passage given to us talk about the fact that Jesus is the firstborn, that through him all things were created. In heaven, on earth, we see principality, authorities, and everything was created through him and for him, and that he is preeminent that our LC is the fullness of God. I think with that passage in mind, and with the questions given to us, what is affected? I want to answer that part. And knowing that fact, uh, as stated in Colossians chapter 1, 15 to 20, what is being affected? To me, it will affect our, in our workplace, it should affect, it should influence our relationship with our colleagues, it should change our working attitudes. And uh, those things we have repeated so many times. So I'm not going to elaborate on that. Uh, the real, uh, our relationship with colleagues. But essentially, it's like some of us have shared, we should try to be the peacemaker. Uh, don't, uh, don't be so calculative about how much work we have worked, that our work is not being appreciated. Do everything heartily, do it for the Lord. That's beautiful, thank you. So a lot of focus on our relationships at work we're hearing. Okay, thank you. Okay, our sisters have said regarding the reconciliation. Yes, when we are reconciled with God, yes, we are agent of God. Okay, so in the workplace, like our sister, both of us also shared, I agree, that we can be the peacemaker in the, work, in the workplace. Meaning to say, we are not supposed to uh, join into the gossip of what's going on or the politics in the office. We must see it on a higher level as, God, as much as what we know, understand how God wants to see the work. And, and we take it from there. We do not... Uh, like a lot over other people too, other colleagues and so on. But we stay focused on, on our God, on God and Jesus. And we go through what he has taught us and apply to our workplace. Yeah. If the uh, uh, people or if the, our colleagues do not subscribe to this, we just uh, need to show this attitude of Christ. Christ's attitude, and from there, most of them, I suppose, uh, or some of them will see the result, or see the, the true nature of God in us. And we 
will be seen as not the same as others who may easily participate in the in the politics in the gossip and so on yeah that's my understanding thank you thank you very much some beautiful thoughts there some lovely ideas um jesus came to reconcile all things and what we see here is a reconciliation that is on at least three different levels um he's reconciling uh, us and god which is the primary um, responsibility but also there's a there's the possibility of reconciliation between person and person with each other that was broken at the fall as well remember the relationships were broken and there's a reconciliation also uh, between us and creation as well so Jesus is supreme over everything and he's bringing reconciliation to all things. I think it's really significant. I mean, Ingrid mentioned it at the end of the last one about God being over all things and us rem remembering that. And here we've had it stated so clearly. Jesus is supreme over the place that you work. Jesus is supreme over this location. Jesus is supreme over our community, our nation. He is supreme over all the rulers and authorities that we see. Sometimes it doesn't feel like that. <laughs> there, is a, uh, there is a thing about this being now and not yet. Jesus is supreme, but he is not making his rule necessarily known over all those things right now. But he will come back and he will make his rule absolutely clear. But he has been given supremacy over all things because of what he's done. And it is good to remember that in those times where we feel pushed down, where we feel particularly in the different workplaces where we are, we feel that we don't have much power or choice to remember that Jesus is supreme gives us great encouragement. And later in Colossians, in Colossians 3, um, 23 to 24, Paul says, to people work as if you're working for God not for human masters he's talking to slaves there he's talking to people who have almost no choice over what happens in their workplace and he says work as if you're working for God and I think that's one of the direct things that we can get out of this the concept of being agents of reconciliation Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 5 he calls us agents of reconciliation and ambassadors for Christ and I think those are really great images that we can take in the workplace. We can see how we can be agents of this reconciliation. We can think about ourselves as ambassadors for Christ in the workplace. Do we represent Jesus well in the places where we operate, where we do our work? I think there's a huge amount of potential. But what is affected? Time and again in this passage, it's there's all things on heaven and on earth. Sometimes I think that we only think of reconciliation as something that is a spiritual thing that happens, which we see when we die. But to think about things on earth being reconciled through Jesus, I think is a really concrete thing. This reconciliation, the impact of Jesus' blood happen, actually impacts on everything around us as well. Um, he is king of the kingdom that he brought to earth. And we'll see it in all its fruition when he comes again. But we can be agents of beginning to bring that kingdom into fruition here now. Okay. Um, another part of this is seeing that we are continuing Jesus' mission. I'll be talking about this on Sunday in more detail. But in Luke chapter 4, we see that Jesus describes what life under the Messiah is, what, what it means when he is supreme over everything. Um, and he actually unrolls the scroll and he reads from Isaiah 61. And that's something that impacts on the way that we see our work. If we think about that, that Jesus has, Jesus talked about him being anointed by the spirit um, and then bringing good news to the poor and opening the eyes of the blind. And as well as the spiritual impact of what he was saying, there's a tangible impact as well. He went on to actually bring good news to the poor and the vulnerable. He went on to open the eyes of the blind. He went on to set the oppressed free. How can we be part of that sort of work through our work as well? How can we be part of bringing this good news? 
How can we be part of opening the eyes of people? How can we continue Jesus' mission? As I say, I'll, I'll talk in much more length about that on Sunday, but I think it's a good idea that to think about how we are actually fulfilling Jesus' mission through our work and in our workplaces. Okay, another little chance to look at a different section. This time, looking at Romans 8, just two verses, 20 to 21. What is the scope of redemption? Thinking about what is crying out for redemption in that passage. And thinking about Romans 8 as a whole, how does redemption go beyond the spiritual, that we are spiritually redeemed? Is that the extent of redemption? But does it keep going to other things as well? So have a little discussion on your tables and then we'll come back again. I think the thing that stands out um, in this section is that it's creation also that is crying out for redemption. We cry out within our souls when we realize that we are sinful and that we need Jesus. But God's creation also is crying out for redemption. So the extent of redemption is probably broader than we sometimes imagine, um, that creation itself also uh, needs to be redeemed. Um, and we see that, that uh, this is the struggle that we see today. Probably we are a generation that are more aware of the needs of our full creation than other generations have been. We know the impact of, of climate change and those things. We're seeing that humanity is linked to creation in a way that possibly it hasn't been recognized as much previously. Um, so we've got to care for creation, but we've also got to see that this is part of the redemption process that Jesus is bringing. He is seeking to um, reconcile to God all things and nothing can separate us um, from that hope that we have in Christ. Uh, even the things that we struggle with in the workplace, even the things that challenge us and so on, we know that Jesus can overcome all these things and that eventually all the things that were wronged and were separated at the fall will be reconciled again within Jesus. These are big ideas, they're big thoughts, um, but this is a summary of what we uh, read in these verses. We know that Jesus came to reconcile all things, all things on hev in heaven and on earth. The extent is much broader sometimes than I think we think about. It is Jesus who is the one who does the redeeming, but we act as his agents in the different places in which we operate, in which we work. And our work itself can actually be part of that act of reconciliation. Um, it might be the actual work that we do, and I think of people who work in conservation, um, people who work in healing and bringing help to others. That sort of work is part of that reconciling action. Um, but it may be who we are in the workplace, as several people have mentioned, how we help to bring people together in the workplace, how we um, show people who Jesus is in the workplace can be also part of bringing um, being those agents of reconciliation. Our work is helping to fulfill Jesus's healing and freeing mission. As I say on Sunday, I'll talk more about that. And our work gives people a taste of the kingdom. There's a potential for us to show people what the kingdom is like, to what it could be like. Well, our goal as Jesus's people in the workplace um, is to show people what work could be. That is part of what we can do in the workplace. Lift people's eyes from the struggles and the hardness. Show people who they could be like. Give them a potential and a taste of the kingdom. Uh, we remember those words that Jesus taught us in the Lord's Prayer. Our work actually should be done on earth as it is in heaven. How can we do that in the work that we do? Our work can reveal God just as Jesus revealed God, he is the visible sign of the invisible God, how can we be the visible sign of the invisible Jesus to the people around us? How can we reveal God through our work? In our work, we can incarnate Jesus. We can be Jesus with skin on. And our work is a way of expressing God's love to people, his reconciling love. Uh, sometimes that's the way that 
God works in the workplace. Um, just as an example of that, um, I remember I met, when I was in Singapore another time, I met a couple of people. There was one lady and she had her friend with her. And the first lady, um, she said that she had actually been working in Shanghai and this friend had come from Shanghai to visit her. And the friend from Shanghai said that when they worked together, the Christian lady was always calm in the face of a lot of stress and pressure in the office. She said she was always amazed at how calm the Christian was. And after a period of time, she said to the Christian woman, what is your secret? How can you remain so calm with all the pressure that we are under? And the Christian lady said, Jesus, Jesus is the secret. She said, who do I have to fear? What do I have to fear? I am secure in Jesus. So the friend wanted to know who this Jesus was and eventually became a Christian. It's just amazing the impact that we can have on others as we just live this out in the workplace. Compassion in the workplace is a big thing too. Time and time again, I hear of Christians who end up um, being the ones in the workplace that other people come to, to tell their troubles to. And part of that is because they trust us, because they know that we won't gossip, we won't pass on their news and so on. And we can often be people of compassion who show kindness and welcome them in and uh, walk with them through their troubles. There's lots of opportunities in the workplace if we open our eyes to them to show people God's love. So uh, an opportunity for you just to talk quickly again on your tables. How is your work redeeming? Is it your work itself that is redeeming? Are you part of work which actually rights wrongs? Are you, is your work itself part of restoring relationships or can you do that in the workplace? Do you bring joy to others? Is that part of your work or is that how you can live it out in the workplace? How do you hold back evil? Is that a role that you can play in your work or in your workplace? And how can you promote what is good? What are the opportunities to do these redeeming activities in your workplace in the name of Christ? So just a few minutes to chat about that, and then we'll come back together. Those conversations to a close. We won't ask for examples just yet, because I want to tell you a story, um, a story of Stephen, but you'll notice on your sheet it says Rowan. Rowan is the actual name. In my book, I wrote it as Stephen. Um, even though I had permission from Rowan to tell his story, um, I, uh, I changed the names of most of the people that I've talked about in my book. So Stephen and Rowan are the same person, just so you know. <laughs> um, but I'll talk about Stephen because Stephen's the name up there. Um, he, for me, is an example of what redeeming work looks like. Um, really fascinating example. So Stephen uh, decided to buy a fruit and vegetable business. Um, and he was going into this... Uh, this purchase and he knew that it was going to be a really difficult business uh, to do. When he went into it and they did the due diligence, he discovered that there were a whole load of problems in this business. One of the things was there was a lot of bribery and corruption in the business. Uh, so often what they would do is they would exchange, you know, monetary gifts to enable better deals to happen. Uh, that was a lot of what the business relied upon. Uh, there were a lot of, most of the employees in the business weren't paid in the proper way. Uh, they were just paid in cash so that uh, the government didn't know that they were employed by the business. Um, and that's illegal in Australia, probably illegal in most places. Um, there were some other really weird things going on. There were, there was, relationships um, in the business that were in, inappropriate. Some people had jobs in the business who shouldn't even have been given work in the business. And just to top it all off, all the plant and equipment in the business was very old and needed to be updated. So Stephen faced a lot of challenges in buying this business. Um, and he, the first thing that he wanted to do was really to talk to people about and ask people to pray with him in terms of this decision to buy this business. Um, so he went to his pastor and asked his pastor, um, told him what the situation was. 
And his pastor said, uh, probably you shouldn't buy that business, Stephen. Um, he said, <laughs> and Stephen sort of thought, well, okay, that's one response, but I'm not really comfortable about that. He uh, decided to see if he would go to another church and he came to another church, which was the church I was going to at the time. He told the pastor that he faced the challenges in this business and uh, that pastor said, take me to that business. I'll walk through it with you and we will pray over the business. And Stephen was greatly impacted by that. He was really um, encouraged by that. And that's what he did. And this pastor actually became part of a team of people that Stephen relied on to bring changes to this business. Stephen knew there were so many challenges and he, he couldn't do them all at once, even though um, he would have liked to make all the changes at once. <laughs> that was a very cute sneeze, bless you. <laughs> um, he knew that he would have to do it one by one because if he did all the changes at once, the business would probably collapse. So the first thing he did was make sure that every employee was paid properly. So all the people went on the books, as, as we say in Australia. In other words, no more cash payments. Some employees didn't like that because they would then have to pay tax. And so some of them left, but the others, um, when it was explained to them the benefits of having annual leave and having sick pay and having superannuation, um, they agreed to, to go on to the new system. So that was the first step. He also dealt with some of the people there who shouldn't have been there. Some of them were actually, there was relationships between different people who worked in the company and people were given jobs just so they could maintain the relationship. So he dealt with those issues as well pretty quickly. In terms of the bribery, uh, that was a harder one for him to deal with because that's the way the whole fruit and vegetable industry ran at that time in terms of the markets. Um, so it was harder for him to actually deal with that. But what he decided to do was give them uh, everybody six months notice. And he said to them, I will no longer pay bribes in six months time. And in the meantime, I want to work with you um, so that we can work together and we can bring about good business for both of us. So we developed relationships with all the people who previously had been paid bribes to. Um, and he said, I want us to work in relationship with each other. I don't want it to be reliant on how much I pay you. At the six month mark, he kept his promise and he said, right, we're going on to um, absolutely transparent relationship now, no cash kickbacks or anything like that. He introduced that system and by then he had the sort of relationship where he was able to move into that system. In the end, after um, a couple of years of really hard work, the business thrived absolutely thrived employees were happy there there had been a lot of turnover of employees previously they tended to stay with the company because they were well paid and what happened without Stephen actually planning for it is that it began to impact on the whole industry because they saw that Stephen's business was thriving the employees and other businesses said hey I want you to put me on the book so I get superannuation now I get a pension <laughs> Um, the people, they saw the way that um, Stephen conducted business in the markets and they said uh, Stephen's way is a better way to, to actually do business. I know that it really did have change. It wasn't just something I heard from Stephen because when I was in Melbourne, I talked to people who worked in the markets in Melbourne and they knew about Stephen and they said that the changes he had made in Sydney were beginning to impact on Melbourne as well. So almost without planning to, Stephen's way of approaching business in this one business actually impacted on the whole industry. Um, and I think what we learn from that is that God's way of doing business, transparency, being honest with people, dealing with people properly, facing up to problems, that's actually the best way to work. That actually brings the best response. Um, and especially in the long term. In the short term, you might have some gains, but in the long term, this way of doing business is the better way to do business. 
he told me that one of the biggest things that happened um, that had a big impact on his workforce was around the area of compassion. So what happened was one of his employees was diagnosed with cancer. Um, and Stephen said, we will take care of you in terms of the business. He said, we will keep employing you and we will look after you until you're back to health. And what impacted on the employees was that they knew that under the previous system, that person would have been left out on their own. It had a really profound impact on everyone else, that compassion that Stephen showed to that employee. So what can we learn about redemption here? What was redeemed within the business? What was made right? Well, human resource, in terms of human resources, the pay, uh, the expectations, the structures were improved. There's renewal of plant and equipment. He updated all of that and things started working a lot better. There was the relationships with the suppliers, no more bribery or corruption. There was a workplace culture of care that he, he introduced, compassion in the workplace. And industry-wide, there were impacts because they knew there was integrity and transparency that was introduced. I tell this story because I think it's such a profound story of the impact that we can have in the workplace, and particularly as business owners, we can actually impact far wider than we imagine, than we can imagine. Just as an addendum to this story, uh, what happened was after a period of time, Stephen sold that business. He sold that business for a lot more money than he paid that business because it was a much bigger business and doing much, much better as a result of that. He sold it to a large corporation from overseas. Within two years, they went bankrupt. They went bankrupt because they did not continue to do the business the way that Stephen had done the business. So actually what happened was he was brought back in <laughs> to buy the business and then to fix the business up. So he's now on his second round <laughs> of working in this business and returning it to profitability. It's a real sign, I think, that um, God's way of doing business is the best way of doing business. As our last exercise, um, I thought what would be good to do is, is just to see if we can split up into the different industry groups that we are in um, to talk about what are the particular challenges that you might face in your vocation? What are some of the issues? What needs to change? What could be redeemed in your vocation? So some of us here are in education. Some of you might be in some sort of retail type business. Some of you are in construction or architecture. Some of you run your own business. Some of you uh, might be in health. Some of you work for the church. Some of you might be involved in the community, neighborhood, at home. Some of you might be involved in agriculture or conservation. Um, I wonder if we could get together and just have a little conversation about what could change in those different um, areas. So can I, I have a show of hands of people who are involved in some way in education? Elizabeth, Dorothy and I will get together. Um, who's involved in retail? Is there anyone involved in retail or shops or selling here? No. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Just one hand. <laughs> Amanda. Um, what about construction, architecture? We're going to have a husband and wife team there, aren't we? <laughs> Anyone else involved in construction or building? Oh, another one? Okay. Thank you. Uh, who's involved in business? Anyone run a business here? No. What about health? Who's involved in health? People involved in doctors? Yep. Okay. So keep an eye out on each other. You can join together. Who's involved in the church? Pastor Malcolm. <laughs> Anyone else involved in church work? Okay. And what about community? Involved at home or in the neighbourhood or community, providing community services? You're involved as well, Dorothy. You're going to be in two places. Um, and what about agriculture, conservation and fisheries and things like that? Yeah, <laughs> three places. <laughs> okay. Um, so what I'd like to do is if we can split up, um, if one of those groups 
you saw the hands that went up, join together with those. If there's a group here that's not really mentioned, um, see if there's something that sounds close to your group. But if we could just have a little conversation together about some of the challenges in our particular industries and how they might be redeemed. And the last thing I'd like you to do is pray for each other in those groups for the vocations that we have. So see if you can join with the people and we'll, this will be the last activity we do and then I'll just say a quick prayer at the end. Okay, let's go, about five minutes.
So maybe take this moment now just to pray for each other on the tables about the work that you do in your vocation. Um, and then I'll do a closing prayer in a couple of minutes. So please go ahead and pray. And finishing up that prayer. Mm. Dear Lord, we pray for those in education, that you will help them to reveal your knowledge and your understanding, and ultimately you. We pray for those who are in retail, Lord, that they will conduct their services in ways that are fair. We pray for those in construction and architecture, Lord, that they will build beautiful things that are firmly made and stand strong. We pray for those in business, Lord, that they will do business in a way that honours you. We pray for those in health, Lord, that they will carry on Jesus' mission of bringing healing. We pray for those in the church, Lord, 
that you will strengthen and enable them to set a good example and to do their work in all areas well. We pray for those in the community and the neighbourhood and the home, Lord, that you'll help them to see that their work is a way of worship to you. We pray for those in agriculture and conservation, Lord, that you'll help them to take care of your creation. We pray, Lord, for those who are in law, that they will uphold justice. In all of this, we remember that we serve Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, firstborn over all creation. We thank you that in Jesus all things were made, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. We thank you that Jesus is supreme over all thrones and powers and rulers and authorities. Thank you that in Jesus all things hold together, including our work. We ask, Lord, that you would enable us more and more to act with compassion and to show Jesus in what we do, and that in this way we might honour you and serve others. Amen. Thank you, everyone. There is just one workshop to go that will be um, tonight. And tonight I'll aim to give you some really practical ideas about what you can do in the workplace and how you can go on living out this theology in all the work that you do. Thank you.